That's the fundamentals of right division. And we're not going to call it Ford just because I drive an F-150, my wife drives an Expedition. There are supposedly other vehicles out there, uh, you know, GMC, Chevy, Toyota, uh, things like that. But no, I, you know, fundamentals right division, that's Ford. So we'll, we'll call it Ford for short. <laughs> Now, we know, I'm sure everybody in here this afternoon knows that rightly dividing is the key to Bible study. So why teach this if we already know this? Well, my, my goal in this series is to systematically, step-by-step, step, explain how to rightly divide the word of truth in your own personal Bible study. It's one thing to know that you need to rightly divide the word. It's something else to actually know how to do it and to do it. And, of course, those who are already grounded in these matters, it's still good to review this material again and be even further grounded in it. I mean, I know this stuff, but I'm looking forward to studying it again and thinking about it again and teaching it again. You know, it's one thing to listen to someone else teach the Bible rightly divided. It's something else for you to know how to study the Bible Personally, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. That's personal. Study to show thyself. And I don't think that's limited to pastors. I know Paul was telling that to Timothy, but it's for all believers, of course. And Timothy, look, a pastor is to be an example to all the other believers. If a pastor is supposed to study the Bible, and he's the example to all believers, then all believers are to study the Bible. And so I don't think st Bible study is limited to pastors and teachers. Um, there is a difference between knowledge and understanding. You might know that the Bible is to be rightly divided. I'm sure everybody in our church knows that. But understanding why <laughs> and understanding how to rightly divide the word of truth is essential if you're ever going to be a serious student of God's word. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2.7, Paul said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Uh, the Bible is God's word. We need God to enlighten us to his word. He'll do that if we consider what Paul said, because what Paul said was by inspiration, and he said it to us in this age of grace. And if you don't recognize the difference between Paul's ministry and the rest of the Scripture, you're going to get very confused. You need to have understanding in all things. You know, learning Paul's epistles not only helps you, obviously, with his epistles, but it helps you with the whole Bible. He said, consider... And that, that word consider has to do with study. I mean, you know, it's not just giving a passing thought to it, but really thinking deeply on it uh, to take heed to it and uh, to apply it. He said, the Lord give thee understanding. Now that's very important. Understanding. In Proverbs 16, verse 22, it says, Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it. But the instruction of fools is folly. You're wasting your time trying to instruct fools. They don't care. <laughs> so don't get hung up on trying to convince fools. Reach the reachable and teach the teachable. Understanding is a wellspring of life. When you understand the things of God, it, it, it's, it's transforming. It, it, it impacts your life. It I can't overemphasize the importance of understanding God's truth. Not just hearing it and saying, yeah, I know the Bible says that. You can know it says that. Do you understand? See, when you understand, it's in your heart. You can, see, you can hear something with your ears. Everybody in here knows 2 Timothy 2.15. You know it just because you've heard me say it so many times. Even if you haven't tried to memorize it, you have. Because <laughs> you hear it. Because it's the key to Bible study. That's why we emphasize it. But knowing that you need to rightly divide and then understanding how to do it on your own, that's something else. So we need to have understanding. Um, most people do not enjoy the Bible because they don't understand the Bible. They don't sit down and systematically read through it and study it and enjoy it because 
they're lost. I mean, they don't, they can pick up, you know, John 3, 16 or familiar verses here and there, but the bulk of it, they don't really, they don't really enjoy it because they don't understand it, and they don't understand it because they don't study it God's way. Once you begin to really understand the Word, and we'll never understand it all this side of heaven. It's a growth process. But as we begin to understand the Word, it creates a desire to keep studying more. Those who really begin to learn the Word have a great desire to keep learning. And I'll just say, if somebody stops, they say, well, okay, I, got, I already know all that, and, the, and their desire stops, there's something wrong with their motive. And we'll talk about that in this series uh, as we get started with it. The motive is very important and why we're studying. Um, we, we are to be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's what Paul said in Colossians 1. He was praying that the saints would, and people say, I, how do I, you know, I can't find the will of God. It's been revealed. You can know the will of God for this present age. In fact, you're to be filled with the knowledge of it. He said in all wisdom, not just the knowledge, but in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. How important is that? He said that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. That implies if you don't know his will and you don't have spiritual wisdom and understanding, you won't walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. And he said being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might and so on. This is, this is vital. Now, Paul talked about knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. That's needed if we're going to serve the Lord. And, you're, you know, I was thinking about when God revealed the tabernacle and all the furniture and the clothing and all that stuff. It said in Exodus 31, verse 1, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the, uh, the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and brass, and so on. He, he needed, to, 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 in other words, to, 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 to be able to work with what God has revealed, he needed God's knowledge, God's wisdom, God's understanding to do this work. It had to come from the Lord. When it comes to the work of ministry, we need God's knowledge, we need God's wisdom, we need God's understanding. We have to rely on the Spirit of God. And Proverbs uh, talks quite a bit about these three things. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. You see on the board here, knowledge has to do with learning. Okay, in, in regard to what we're talking about, we're going to say learning God's truth. Getting a knowledge of what God's truth says. That's where it starts. That's not where it stops. You need to learn and know what God's word says. But then there's that understanding and that has to do with comprehending it. And we'll never fully comprehend all the Word of God, but you get the point. There's a difference between just knowing something superficially and comprehending it. You know, I'm coaching Carter's baseball team right now, and I tell these kids, this is what you need to do. This is what you're supposed to do in this situation. But if that's all I say, they're not likely to do it very much. <laughs> I need to get them to understand why they do that. If there's a runner on first and there's two outs, this is what we're going to... Well, if they're understanding the game, if they're comprehending, they're going to they're gonna perform. Okay? You've got to understand. It's not just that you know, you've got to understand. Uh, when I'm trying to teach them how to, the proper mechanics of hitting the baseball, I can show them all day long and tell them all day long, but until it clicks in their mind and understand why they're supposed to do this, it's, they're not going to implement it, you see? So understanding in any endeavor... It's crucial, but then that wisdom, once you learn it and you begin to understand it, now you got to use it, okay? And wisdom is the proper use of God's truth in your life. Knowing, you know, you can know what the Bible says, but that doesn't mean you have the wisdom to do with it what you should. There are some people that have a lot of knowledge of the Bible, and they're idiots when it comes to the work of the ministry. They, they... <laughs> They're crazy in how they do things because they're not using it properly. You've got to have divine wisdom to, to use God's knowledge the right way. Somebody said that knowing that a tomato is a fruit is knowledge. Knowing it doesn't belong in a fruit salad is wisdom, right? 
So, you know, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. We want to understand why we rightly divide, how to rightly divide, that we might have the wisdom to live our lives based on that. Because if you're not rightly dividing the word of truth, it's going to hurt your Christian walk. Okay, I've said this so many times. Rightly dividing is not just some novel thing where we're different from others. and It's not an, just an academic pursuit. It's, it's how we live. And if you don't understand that, I mean, you start claiming the wrong prayer promises and see wh where that leads you. I've talked to people who were in great depression over stuff like that. When you don't know what God's doing today and how, you know, you don't understand God's will for this age, it's going to eventually really hurt you. Now, 2 Timothy. Uh, I believe 2 Timothy was the last book written by inspiration of God. Paul said that he fulfilled the word of God. Hebrews to Revelation are placed after Paul's epistles for a dispensational reason uh, I, I think Hebrews through Revelation were all written during the book of Acts. Uh, I think 2 Timothy was the last book to be written, and that's fitting because it's in 2 Timothy we find two great truths that I emphasize week after week, and that is number one, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. There's only one other reference to that. To inspiration in the Bible. It's in the oldest book of the world, Job. There's, in, there's a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. It's fitting that you have a mention of inspiration in the first and last books that were written. Now that everything's been written, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But even though all Scripture is profitable, it's going, to, it's going to become unprofitable to you if you don't study it the right way. Believing the Bible is not enough. There are a lot of heretics that believe the Bible. There are people that teach false doctrine that believe the Bible is the Word of God. And the reason why they're teaching false doctrine is because they're not rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Believing the Bible is where you start. That's not you. Once you believe it, you need to learn how to study it. Because if you don't, you can be sincere and believe this Bible is the Word of God. And you can say, I believe every word of God. And God said, keep the Sabbath holy. That's what the Bible says, and I believe it. Well, that is what the Bible says. It's not what it said to you. And then you turn around and tell people they have to be on the Sabbath day. That's heresy in this age. That was sound doctrine in the past dispensation. It's heresy today. So, that's why before... He said, 2 Timothy 3.16, he said, 2 Timothy 2.15, even though it's all for us, it is not all to us. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that all the scripture has been given and everything's been revealed, there's a great need to rightly divide. Before Paul's ministry, there wasn't that need. But now that Paul's ministry reveals God's mystery program for the body of Christ that's very different from his earthly program concerning Israel, you better rightly divide these things. Now, um, if we're going to get the profit out of it that God put in it for us, we're going to have to study it his way. Now, there's uh, uh, i got a new outline for you. I've always said, 2 Timothy 2.15, the only verse in the Bible tells us to study, tells us exactly how, to study the Bible, it tells us exactly how. We're told what to do, study. We're told why to do it, and we're told how to do it, right? Well, that's your mandate, your motive, and your method. God has said study. That doesn't sound like a uh, suggestion to me. <laughs> Sounds like a commandment. Remember now in the pastoral epistles, we talked about that this morning. There's a lot of charges, commands, injunctions, mandates, orders. Study! That's the mandate. Why? So you can know more than somebody else and look down on them. <laughs> no. No, to show thyself approved unto God. And if God is not your motive in your study, you're wasting your time. That's very crucial. We'll talk about that next time. Uh, next lesson. But anyway, the motive is to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. We're going to give an account of our service at the judgment seat of Christ. People, I've had several people ask me lately, what does that mean, approved unto God? Aren't we complete in Christ? Yeah, we're complete in our standing, 
But in our state, how we serve the Lord, it will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, and not everybody's going to be crowned. Not everybody's going to be rewarded. Some are going to suffer loss because they didn't follow the wise master builder concerning how to build on the one foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Paul laid the foundation in that he preached Christ according to Revelation of the mystery. He's, Paul's not the first one to preach Christ. He's the first one to preach him that way, though. That's how he laid the... Now, look, I heard somebody recently say, oh, you people think Paul's the foundation. No, we don't think that at all. Paul is not the foundation. Christ is, but Paul laid the foundation. That's what he said, and he did that by preaching Christ according to Revelation of the mystery. We're going to be judged for our service, and if we didn't serve God his way... We're going to be ashamed. Okay? You're going to suffer loss. Oh, you say, well, all that matters is I'm in heaven. Well, that's, that's, the reason why you think like that now is because you're so carnal. But when you get to heaven and you're spiritual, you're not going to think that way. You're going to have some major regrets. Now, being in heaven is wonderful. But I tell you what, wouldn't it be a terrible thing to stand before the Lord and and have nothing for his glory to show that he used your life. Just nothing. Just wood, hay, stubble, burn up. There needs to be gold, silver, and precious stones. And the only way that's going to happen is if you rightly divide the word of truth. I think there's a present application, too, that uh, God's not approving your ministry right now if you're not rightly dividing. And you may not know that, but you'll know it at the judgment seat of Christ. And then he said... Here's the method. If you're going to study, this is exactly how you do it, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is the divine key. That's what God told us to do. So we're only going to take a few lessons to cover the first two points of our mandate and the motive in it. And then the rest of the series will be all about the method. How do you rightly divide? What does that even mean? How do we do it? And we'll talk about that you know, very practically and systematically. Let's just uh, finish out today talking about this thing of study. The word study is only used three times in the Bible. It's used in Ecclesiastes. And this is for all those people who say, oh, well, you know, because Paul told Timothy, he said, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, I, I know something about labor, physical labor and spiritual labor. Uh, you say, what do you know about physical labor? Well, I just happened to work with a roofing crew during a summer in Georgia. <laughs> Summertime in Georgia is the wrong time to be on a roof, I guarantee you that. Anybody who knows anything about roofing knows that's one of the hardest jobs there is as far as just labor is concerned, especially me. I wasn't the expert. I didn't get to do all the skill work. I was just the guy carrying all the bundles of shingles on his shoulders. I, that's why my back is still probably messed up. And we were up there in the hills of North Georgia where you couldn't get the lativator to shoot the uh, shingles up there easily. I was usually the lativator. I had to put two, and I would put a couple bundles on both shoulders. That was a long time ago. <laughs> and go up and down that ladder taking those bundles of shingles up there. And that, you know, that's kind of labor. I worked uh, at a truck stop out there where there's nothing but asphalt as far as the eye can see. And all these trucks running, all these diesel trucks running in Florida where it's 190 degrees. And I don't know if you've ever tried to change a semi-truck tire, but it's not the easiest thing in the world to handle. Okay, so I understand something about that. And I'm not afraid to do that. In fact, sometimes I wish I was doing that again. It'd be therapeutic in a sense. But when it comes to, where am I at? I didn't even turn over there. But in Ecclesiastes 12, there is this issue. And Solomon was a, he, he was the wisest man. And God gave him that wisdom. And he, he learned a lot. He applied himself to learning things. He said in Ecclesiastes 12, 12, And further by these, my son, be admonished, but of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. So when we're talking about Bible study, that's a spiritual labor, but it can even wear you out physically, even your flesh. When you really try to study a passage for eight hours at a time or something like that, it's not like, oh, this is a walk in the park, you know. <laughs> so Bible study 
I think one of the reasons why people don't do it is because they don't want to do it because it's work. It's a lot easier just to Google it, right? I'm going to tell you something. That's what a lot of people know about the Bible. What they got off YouTube. What they got off of the Internet. I read an article on that. Well, quit reading everybody's article and study the Bible for yourself. That's what people do. They hear something. I don't know if I believe that or not. Let me go find who else teaches this. And let me who else says this. And then they, instead of going to the book, and I'm going to tell you, you want to get thoroughly confused, just go online and try to study the Bible that way. It's like what Paul said, ever learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. There is a work to Bible study. Uh, then Paul said, the other references, of course, is 2 Timothy 2.15, but also 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, verse 11, some people, this is easier for them than others, depending on personality. Verse 11, that you study to be quiet, <laughs> and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded. You know, if people actually followed that, it would solve so many problems. Mind your own cotton pig in business. That's, what, that's the new translation. <laughs> if, if people would focus on doing what they were supposed to do and quit being so worried about what everybody else is doing or isn't doing, no, study to be quiet. And he's talking about basically when you're on the job, don't be running your mouth. Do what you're supposed to do. Mind your business. Work with your own hands. And so he said study to be quiet because for a lot of people that don't come easy. <laughs> Most people, you know, we have a hard time. I, I've been known to say things I shouldn't say. Maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. But I, I think most of us struggle with that sometimes. Um, you know, the word study as a noun, it, it is, the, Webster's 1828 says, literally a setting of the mind or thoughts upon a subject Hence, application of mind uh, to books, to arts, or science, to any subject for the purpose of learning what is not before known. Okay? As a verb, uh, it is to consider attentively, to examine closely, to endeavor diligently. So when he says 1 Thessalonians 4.11, he's using it in that verb in the sense of endeavoring diligently. Now, most modern translations, they try to bring that over to 2 Timothy 2.15 and they change the word study to say something like do, do your best. But when he says study in 2 Timothy 2.15, that's exactly what he means. He's talking about Bible study. Okay, you got to look at the context of how the word is used. But, it, but, but the thing is, is it's, it's always an issue of something you are doing attentively and, 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 and diligently and... Study is not just reading, okay? Real study is work. That's why he said a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. You know what? It, anybody can read a commentary. But you need to study the Bible. And look, I'm not saying don't use commentaries. You can check them out and use them, I do, but always study the Bible for yourself. Don't just rely on somebody else's study. Most people, everything they got is secondhand. You know, everything they got. That's why it's like parrots just repeating each other. Um, you can tell the, the preachers who've been influenced by certain teachers because they all have a tendency to say the same basic things about the same issues. We need to learn how to, to, to do personal Bible study and not just rely on somebody else's work. Uh, the Bible said that the, uh, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in Acts 17.11. Why? Because they received the word with all readiness of mind. How about that? Readiness, I mean attentiveness. Thinking about it. He's, and it said they searched the scriptures daily. Not just Sunday, but daily. They searched the scriptures. And it was a lot harder. They didn't have eSword or, you know, an iPad where it's just so easy. I don't even use a concordance anymore like the, the actual Strong's. I, I don't remember the last time I opened an actual concordance book. 
Everything I do as far as cross-referencing is, is, is on uh, the computer. It's so much faster. Why wouldn't I do that? But can you imagine having to say, all right, now I think that's in the book of Romans. Where is that scroll again? I mean, everything was the way it was hard to search the scriptures back then. They didn't have all 66 books in one nice leather-bound goatskin volume, <laughs> okay? That, it wasn't that way. It was tough. Look at Proverbs 2. This has always been a, a, one of my favorite passages along these lines. Isn't the knowledge of God's word worth our effort? Think about that. What do we put effort into? You know, things that matter. When we got something that's important to us, we tend to put effort into it. So, so, you know, everybody says they believe the Bible. Everybody says they believe the Bible is God's word. I mean, most, I mean I'm talking about professing Christians. Everybody, yeah, they know what to say, but how do, are we proving it by our actions? If I say this is the very words of God, but I'm never going to pick it up and, and study it, something's, there's some disconnect there, don't you think? And there's nothing worth our time and attention and effort like the Word of God. Proverbs 2, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart unto understanding, there are certain things, steps, conditions in order to arrive at some things. He said, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then, if you do all this, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, which is, you know, why most people don't fear the Lord today. Because they don't do any of the things we just saw. Then, and you say, how important is the fear of the Lord? Oh, no big deal. It's just the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> That's a big deal, okay? That's just the beginning of wisdom. So that means if you don't fear the Lord, you have no wisdom. It says, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Nothing more important than the knowledge of God. For, now, look at this. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge, and understanding. There's the three things. Now, it comes from God. What man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even, and Paul said, look, you don't know the things of God but by the spirit of God. It comes from God. However, God's not going to just drop it into your head. He's not going to just drop it into your heart. You're going to have to get in his word to get his word in you. You're going to have to put in some effort and put in some work. And it's very rewarding there's nothing more important. I mean, how much effort would you put into searching for literal treasures? If somebody gave you a treasure map that says, if you, if you figure this out, there's a code here, and if you decipher it, it'll lead you to $100 million. You would break your neck trying to figure that out. You would do what it took to figure it out. You would, you would do, I mean, you would spend all kind of time and effort and energy to figure that out. Please, this is a hundred million. A hundred million dollars is nothing compared to the Word of God. Right? Because the Word of God is the key to eternal life. It's the key to peace and joy and contentment. It's, it's, there's nothing more important than the Word of God. And we say we believe that, but we don't act like we do. You know, the number one thing when it comes to Bible study is desire. You could tell somebody exactly how to study the Bible, but they're not going to do it until they want to. And that's people's biggest problem. They don't want to. I wonder why. That's, it's odd. Peter said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It ought to be as natural as a baby wanting milk. When you have the Spirit of God in you, there ought to be a, a natural desire for the Word of God. But if you fill yourself up with the things of the world, the full soul loatheth a honeycomb, Proverbs says. When you're already full, you don't have an appetite for anything else. 
And when you fill up on the garbage of the world, you have no appetite for the honey of God's word. And so what I'm saying is, is that if you really believe, look, I'm not going to run all the references because there's so many. In Psalm 119 and other passages, it talks about how the word of God is, 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 is more valuable than all the treasures in the world, basically. There's so many verses like that. It compares it to, to you know, I mean, if, if you could... Have all the money that there is in this world right now, it's nothing compared to the truth of this book in terms of value. You know, some of the most miserable people in this world today have the most money. It can't buy you peace. Everybody always thinks, you know, when we live in this, this society that's so driven by covetousness, if I just had this, finally I'd be happy. No, your problem is you. You're not happy because of you. It's not because you don't have this car or you don't have these clothes or you don't have... If, you're, if you have Christ, you have everything. And if you would trust Him and look to Him and enjoy your walk with Him, you would, you would have godliness with contentment, which is great gain. Paul said, you brought nothing into this world. It's certain you can carry nothing out. He said, they that will be rich... They drown themselves. I mean, they, they, he, he said this is foolish and hurtful lust. The love of money is the root of all evil. He didn't say money is evil. He said the love of it is. If, if we would put the time and the effort and the energy into the Lord of God that we do carnal things and material things. You know, some guys, and I'll pick on the golfers because I hate golf. Okay? The only good thing about it is it's outdoors. That's the only good thing about it. Other than that, it just... And the reason why I say that is because I'm not good at it. If I was good at it, I'd love it, but I'm terrible at it. I, I get up there and try to hit it like a baseball. It doesn't work out too well. My grandfather was good at it. My dad was good at it. And, but I'm not. It didn't pass on to me. But you think about some of these guys, the amount of time. And by the way, you're not, I don't care how talented you are. You will not be good at golf without immense time and money. Okay. The only way you get really good is to go down there day after day and it's not cheap to buy the clubs and it's not cheap to have the membership and it's not cheap to play the game. But you go down there and you spend all this time and all this effort and you're trying to master this game. You chase a little ball around out there in the grass. And you think about it at the end of the day, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I mean, you know? Again, I'm not saying it's a sin to play golf. What I'm saying is it's wrong to put golf before the Scripture. I, people will spend so much time and so much effort and so much energy on things that don't even matter. If you have the time and the effort and energy to be a good golfer, you can be a good Bible student if you wanted to be. And I don't know of anybody in here that's a big golfer. Uh, so that's why I picked on that. We'll, t we'll talk about guns, Brother Smith. I mean, I mean, we can talk about guns or what else we <laughs> He's a gunsmith. <laughs> nothing wrong with having a hobby. Nothing wrong with having activities. That's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is, why don't we put the time and the effort and energy into the Word of God? Again, you got to rely on the Lord because if he doesn't give you understanding, you're not going to get it. But I know this. He's not going to give understanding to somebody who's not even trying. All right. Now, with, so there's no greater privilege than to have the treasure of God's word. Um, in Psalm 119, listen to this. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Which, by the way, by the way, let me just read some of the context here. Princes have persecuted me without a cause, and I got bitter and cried. No, but my heart standeth in all of thy word. When you're focused on the word of God, you tend to not care so much what everybody else thinks. I mean, if you know what God says, why, why, if you know what God says... And you know what pleases God? Why would you care what people think so much? But a lot of people do. And then he said, He said, Great peace have they which love thy law, nothing shall offend them. And so when, when people are easily offended, you know right away it's somebody who doesn't spend much time in the Word of God. 
Period. Does that verse mean what it says? Of course it does. If you, if you love the Word of God, you're going to have such great peace, you're not going to walk around getting offended about everything. So I said, you know, so-and-so didn't like, how do I, so? <laughs> Who cares? Let's move on. Why? I mean, we got the Word of God. If you got the Word of God, that's what you need to be thinking about instead of sitting there, I wonder what so-and-so really thought about this and that. No, we need, to, we need to be focused on the Word of God. Now, let's finish up with seven points. That was all introduction. <laughs> I'm not going to, this is, this is a very simple thing. I'm not going to say much about it. You know what? Studying is just one part of all that goes into our responsibility towards God's Word. With great, there's nothing more wonderful than having the Word of God. That's the greatest privilege but with that privilege and blessing comes responsibility. You know, there are people in this world that would give anything to have one book of the Bible in their language. And we, we have, you go down to the dollar store and you can buy a Bible for a dollar in America. A King James Bible, literally for a dollar. And yet our culture is so biblically ignorant and illiterate. It's sad. And, and, and we see it's one thing to have the privilege and the, and, the, and the blessing. It's something else to realize your responsibility. It, it starts with reading, okay? If you won't do this, you, forget the rest of it, okay? Because anybody, I mean, if you can read, and, I, and if you can, I'm not picking on you, but hey, guess what? There's a thing called, uh, you know, they, they, they're, they're, it used to be cassette tapes, you know, or records, <laughs> of Alexander Scorby, but now it's so easy to, to hear the Bible there on your phone. You can listen to the Bible. I mean, you can hear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I'm pretty sure most everybody in here can read, though, but this is an application. I understand the context, but Isaiah 34, 16 says, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. <laughs> All right? That tells you several things. That tells you there is a book of the Lord. God wrote a book, and it's available. You can seek it out and find it. And if you know God wrote a book, and you can find it, seems like you'd want to read it, <laughs> right? I mean, God Almighty gave us his own word. Job said, I esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food, and Job didn't even have the Bible. It ever dawn on you that Job didn't even have the book of Job? He didn't know how it was going to turn out. <laughs> seek you out the book of the Lord and read you know what reading it. Just read the Bible. When you read the Bible, you become familiar with its contents. You ought to know what's in there. That's why you should read all the way through the Bible. Again and again and again. Read the Bible all the way through. From Genesis to Revelation. And when you're done, start over and do it again. Okay? I'm not a fast reader. By any means. Okay? Okay? But, I mean, I've read the whole Bible, I think the quickest I ever did it was 90 days, which is real quick for me. But I don't, I, now I do it about twice a year, okay? All right, just read it. And if I can read the Bible twice a year, anybody can, because I'm, I'm not a fast reader. My wife, when she reads something, it blows me away. I'm like, hey, read this. She's like, okay. I'm like, what? How did you read that? But that's, she just... Boom, she just zooms right through it. I'm, she'll give me a, just one little piece of paper, and I'll look at it for 30 minutes trying to read it, you know. I read slowly, but that, that's actually good in a way. R read at whatever pace you can, you know, think about what you're reading. Read. That's how you just get familiar with what's in the book, but then you need to study it. You know what, you know what study is? It's, it's, it's reading it very carefully, trying to understand what you're reading. Examining it. It's a close examination, a very careful reading, where you're not just reading it to read it, you're seeking to understand what you're reading. And we're told to study the Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15. But then there's this issue of meditation, and that's... There's, there's a lot in like the Psalms about that. But even Paul told Timothy to meditate. He told them, by the way, uh, to be nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine. That's a personal thing. 
Uh, a lot of people, all they get is secondhand food. In other words, almost regurgitated food. <laughs> Somebody else studied it, got the essence out of it, and went through their system. Now they're delivering. But some people, they never get anything firsthand for themselves. When you get in the Bible for yourself, you get the most nourishment. And when you're nourished up, he said, in 1 Timothy 4, he said, verse 15, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Uh, when you meditate in God's word, it's going to be obvious to people. When you meditate and give yourself to the word of God, people, it's going to be... It's going to be appearing to all when they hear you that you know what the Word of God says. Okay? Meditate upon these things. That is to think. Once you examine it carefully, seeking to understand it, then you ought to think a lot about it. Meditation is to the soul what digestion is to the body. Lost art today. Very few meditate. That's why, I mean, it could literally take hours just to look at a few verses when you're studying it and meditating on what you're studying. All right, now, I have never, and let, well, I take this back. I think when I was in Bible college, they said you have to memorize certain verses. So I had to purposely try to. But other than that, ever since I've been out of school, I have not tried to memorize verses. I think that you've got, you know, sometimes I've known of people that have a lot of Bible memorized and they're teaching false doctrine. It's not doing them much good. So what happens is as you meditate, you begin to hide it in your heart. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So you can memorize something in your mind. That's different than, than hiding it in your heart. When you hide it in your heart, it's going to impact how you live. Hide it in your heart. If you meditate, you will learn Scripture. You'll be able to talk Scripture. You'll be able to quote Scripture just because it's in your heart. It's a part of who you are. You think about that. Hide it in your heart. And then look in Proverbs 22. You know what? It's not the preacher's job to make all the applications. You know, some preachers, that's all they worry about. How am I going to apply this to my people? Well, you know what? All I'm going to do is preach the word and let the Holy Spirit apply it to you if you're listening. <laughs> you can get the application. When you get in that book, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit make it real personal to you. I don't need somebody up there trying to apply this. I know how to apply the scripture. I don't understand these people. They need somebody else to... All what if, do you read the thing? How can you get in this book and not see the proper applications of it? Proverbs 22, verse 17. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart. That's your responsibility. You know as well as I do, you can have a student in a classroom that's hearing the same instruction and one of them do poorly and the other do well and the difference is One's applying themselves and the other isn't. Of course, I know there is something to, you know, difference in intelligence, but I'm saying even somebody who's not that sharp, if they applied themselves, can learn things. Um, apply thine heart unto my knowledge, for it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips. I mean, you'll speak what you believe and what you know. That thy trust may be in the Lord, I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. How important it is. Well, you, how do you trust a God that you don't know? You don't even know what he said. How can you trust him if you don't know what he said? Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge? That I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. That thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that sin unto thee application as you read the word and then you begin to study it and meditate and hide it there's going to be an application to your life and there is a proper application 
as you rightly divide, you'll know there are some things in this book you're not supposed to do. Okay? You'll know the proper application. Not everything in this Bible is something for you to obey. There are things in this Bible it's just for you to know and believe. But there are plenty of things that we do need to obey. And when it's applied to our hearts, that's the next step. That's obedience. Paul said in Romans 6, 17, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Do you see how it made a difference? You were the servants of sin. You're not now. Why? You've obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine. You can't obey what you don't know. But you have to believe it in your heart to obey it in your life. If there become, the Bible said the word of God worketh effectually in them that believe. It's spirit, soul, and body. You know the truth, spirit. You believe the truth, soul. You work out the truth, body. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know what? If all we ever do, and I mentioned it this morning, it said the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is to be the pillar and ground. If all we ever do is learn truth, but we never live it, that's a problem. That's out of balance. The Bible said adorn the doctrine of God. Put it on. Live it. Paul told Timothy, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Here's how you ought to live if you believe sound doctrine. And he very specifically told people how to live. Say, hey, tell the young women this is what they ought to do. Tell the old women this is what they ought to do. Young men, old men, all that stuff, okay? This is how you ought to live. You know, people say, well, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm more practical than I am doctrinal. <laughs> There's nothing more practical than doctrine. The first two letters in doctrine is D-O, do. <laughs> okay? You, you learn truth that you might live truth. Again. There are things in this Bible that you are not supposed to. There's not, every, not everything in this Bible is something you're supposed to be doing. There are things you just need to believe. And that's important. But there is plenty to do. Okay, And then you know what? The last step is teaching others. And that's for all. But every believer should be teaching someone else what the Word of God says. And if all we ever do is meet in these walls... And have Bible study in here, and it doesn't continue on in our families, in our homes, in our realm of influence. We're failing. You ought to come here to be fed that you can be a better Bible student on your own and, and learn the Word of God on your own so that you can... Everybody has a realm of influence. Everybody has somebody they can influence for Christ. And if you're never opening your mouth telling others what you know is true... You know, you're really missing the boat here because Paul told Timothy, we saw it this morning, and the things which thou hast heard of me among uh, many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men also. Uh, the, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. And that's how the thing keeps going. We keep passing it down. Um, I, as I study the Bible, it's not just to say, well, I learned this. I mean, it's, it's not just about us. Obviously, our personal spiritual walk is important. But you're, we're supposed to be a channel, not a sponge. As we learn, we ought to then pass that on to somebody else. Or, I mean, look, if it's made a difference in your life, it seems like you'd want to see that happen in others. Now, of course, not everybody wants to hear it. If somebody says, I don't want to hear it, we just move on to the next one. But try to teach others also. Um, you know, I hope to God that the things that are taught in this church don't just stay here on this property. The key is that we're in our daily lives every day sharing it with other people. In our own family, our own friends, our own neighborhood, our own co-workers, whatever. And so, it's very simple it's just a matter of doing it. Get in that book. Read it. But don't just read it. Study it. And as you study it, meditate on what you're learning. And as you do that, you'll hide it in your heart. It'll be applied in your life and worked out in obedience. And then you'll be teaching others. 
But we have a mandate. The mandate is to study. And so, Lord willing, next time we're going to talk about that motive. Because if you're wrong on your motive, you're off track from the very beginning. The motive matters. With God, it's not just what we do, it's why we do it. Did you know your motive is going to be an issue at the judgment seat of Christ? That's why Paul said, judge nothing before the time. And until the Lord come, he said, he'll make manifest the counsels of the heart. Then shall every man have praise of God. God will not only reveal what you did, but why you did it. Motive matters. And I think that if we have the right motive in Bible study, we'll do it. I think that's the number one problem with people is they don't have enough desire and they don't have the right motive. That's why they don't study the Word of God. And the reason why they don't have the desire is because they're walking after the flesh instead of the Spirit. Because I know this. One th I know something about the Holy Spirit. When you're yielded to the Holy Spirit, there's going to be a desire for the Word of God. It's impossible for somebody to be yielded to the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and not care about the Word of God. You are kidding yourself. That Spirit of God wrote that book. One of the main reasons He's in you is that you might know that book. And so it's a spiritual thing, not just an academic. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we have the book.